Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Dillerstone Group results presentation. Uh, to start with, if we could cover a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, which you will see on your screens. Um, throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. However, questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen, or if anyone has dialed in via dillerstone at walbrookpr.com. Uh, the company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives today. Um, however, the company will review all questions submitted and publish responses where appropriate. These will be available via your InvestorMeet company dashboard. Finally, we would like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Um, I would now like, now like to hand you over to Chief Executive Jason Starr and Finance Director Ian Mackin. Gentlemen. Tom, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Uh, my name is uh, Jason. I'm, I'm the CEO. And in a moment, I'll be passing over to Ian, who will take you through the numbers. Ian is our finance director. Um, obviously, uh, it's tradition to begin these with uh, a lengthy reading of a disclaimer. But I'm, I'm guessing the fact that you've all got the wisdom to attend this session means that you've done this plenty of times before. So I'll skip past that. Um, what we're going to share with you is, is our, in our view, um, uh, the final stages of a turnaround story. Um, for anyone that knows our business that's followed us for a few years, will know we had a number of issues, some of them caused by ourselves, some of them caused by extraneous factors, uh, COVID, but you'll see um, pretty much since 2021 20, uh, 20, uh, and, and the COVID period, we've seen consistent improvement in our results. Um, we've seen a step change this year though. Uh, we've moved into profitability, but as Ian will share in a moment, some of our underlying metrics have improved considerably, despite the fact that our market, which is the um, recruitment software market, is one that is very, very challenging at the moment. And we'll talk a bit about that and the impact that has on our business both last year and going forward. Um, for those that don't know us too well, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about what we do up front, but I will circle back to this. But essentially, we provide a number of products to recruiters. Our clients range from high street temping agencies that you might see on every in every town center through to executive search firms. We work with a handful of corporate clients. We work with some very big firms, some very small firms. We have clients of the UK, in the States, in Asia, in Africa, in Australia, and um, all points in, in between. I'll talk a bit more about the dynamics and the products and what they do momentarily. But uh, before we get into that, allow me to introduce Ian to talk you through the numbers. Ian. Thank you, Jason. I thought I'd start by putting some context behind the results we've just announced for 2023. The chart on screen, the underlying EBITDA is the blue bar and the adjusted operating profit, the yellow bar. Adjusted means before acquisition costs, one-offs and support received from various governments relating to COVID. What we can see from the chart is the EBITDA gradually reducing from 2017 to 2019 before dropping dramatically in 2021. This was mirrored somewhat in the adjusted operating profit and it reached a low of 465,000 in 2020 before recovering slightly. What is steady during this time is the underlying EBITDA margin percentage, which is the red line. It fluctuated in a narrow range between 13 and 16 percent in these years. In 2022, we began to break out of that range with the margin close to 17%. This accelerated in 23 to a breakout margin of 23.5%. The effect of that is essentially on the same revenue as 2021. The EBITDA increased 77% between 21 and 23 to stand at 1.341 million. We turned a 2021 operating loss of 381,000 into an operating profit in 2023 of 220,000 on the same revenue. So that's a quick history of where we were. Now on to the year we've just reported. As alluded to on the previous slide, EBITDA has increased due to the margin improvement to stand 38% above the 20. 22 level at 1.314 million. Loss before tax reduced greatly by 77% to stand at 0.104 million. Revenue held up relatively well despite the weak market, with total and recurring revenue down 2% each. 
The TACV, which is a forward-looking measure we use, includes known cons cancellations, but none of the potential good news that we may have in the next 12 months. The market conditions are due to impact us in 2024, with TACV down from the 2022 20, forecast. However, this is not unexpected given the market conditions in the recruitment space and adjustments to the cost base have already been made with this in mind. Operating cash reduced by 11% to 1.063 million, the majority of the decrease being associated with reorganisation costs, ensuring the business has the right footprint for the forthcoming year. So on to a broadly positive set of results. Although, as mentioned, revenue was 2% down, the improvement in cost of sales meant gross profit was actually 2% up. EBITDA jumped 38% to 1.314 million, with the margin having a step change from 16.7% to 23.5%. Adjusted operating profit, which refers to figures before acquisition, reorganisation and one-off costs, moved into positive territory for the first time since 2018 at 220,000. And a similarly adjusted profit before tax showed a profit of 65,000 from a loss of 290,000 in the prior year. It's interesting to note that the movement between years at EBITDA level has flowed all the way through the accounts of the adjusted profit before tax level, and we have eliminated the loss after tax. The net effect of this is we recorded a marginally positive EPS of 0.74p, a penny better than the negative EPS of 0.26p in 2022. The operating cash before working capital movement was up significantly at 1.206 million. The working capital move is mainly due to the decrease in deferred income from the annual billing cycle for reductions received throughout 2023. We do not expect such a quantum move to be repeated in 2024. We received a slightly reduced tax refund at 201,000, leaving net cash 11% down at 1.063 million. With investing activities slightly down 50,000 and financing activities broadly in line with 2022. The financing activities are mainly the repayment of the principal and interest on the civil loan. At December 2023, we were halfway paying through paying the 1.5 million loan, and it has a repayment date of June 26. Taking investing and financing activities into account, the overall net change in cash and cash equivalents increased to 441,000 outflow from 362,000 outflow in 2022. We ended the year by utilising 19,000 of our bank facility. Post year end, we successfully extended this facility with our bank in March 24. And we believe that gives us enough operational stability as we continue to pay down the civil loan through to repayment in June 26. Now, let me hand you back to Jason for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, the way we, we, we would explain the last year's results is we I think we've done a decent job in maintaining the costs and restructuring the business to make us a lot more agile, a lot more lean, and a lot more able to deliver at a lower level of revenue. But obviously, the thing that stands out is the lower level of revenue. So it's, it's worth talking a bit about that. As I touched on, our clients are recruiters. Recruiters are having a tough time of it at the moment. And what that means is, although we're not recruiters, you know, we don't hire people per se, um, our clients do. And when they are having a tough time. What tends to happen is they reduce the number of licenses they use from companies like ours. They don't buy additional licenses for new team members. Um, and they tend not to buy new software. Uh, they tend not to go into the market. Um, and obviously, some companies disappear entirely. So what that tends to mean is that um, uh, when the recruitment sector has a tough time as, as, as it is now that has a direct and pretty much immediate impact on us so i think it's worth thinking about that in the context of the revenue line and then if i if i dive a bit deeper into the two parts of our business so we basically sell to recruitment companies as i mentioned we split them into two groups so we've got contingency and executive search contingency 
broadly speaking, will typically be a UK-based uh, recruitment agency, possibly a temping agency, something of that sort. It's a bit simplistic, but that's typically who our contingency clients are. Um, that is a market that we serve through free products. We have a product called uh, Voyager Infinity, which is a, a CRM. We have a product called MidOffice, which is a tool designed to help facilitate the, the payment of temps. And we have a platform known as ISV, which is a, um, a skills testing platform used to assess candidates as they go through the recruitment process. Now, um, the contingent market has had a tough time. Most of the headlines I shared with you a moment, relate, a moment ago related to contingency recruiters. But despite that, we've basically been able to maintain our revenue. And if you look at the hit recent history of our contingency division, you can see it did have a tough time up until 2020. Uh, we turned it around, we reposition, repositioned it to focus on temps. And in 2021, 2022, it grew. It grew marginally this year, uh, but our view is that the slowdown, uh, the significant slowdown in revenue growth on this side of the business was a reflection of the market. No big companies in the market, existing companies getting smaller, therefore spending less money with us. So our view that pretty much as soon as the uh, contingency market comes back, as soon as the recruitment market comes back, our standard products, assuming they maintain their market share and perform as they've done in the past, will go back to the levels of growth that we've seen pre previously. So um, we, we feel that when the economy recovers, we're already in a decent place for our contingency software. Um, during uh, the last period, we've uh, continued to develop um, and we've updated all of our products over the last 12 months, at least all of our contingency products. And we have a number of uh, significant enhancements coming in H2. Um, the exact search side of the business, though, is slightly different. Um, historically, uh, we had a product called Farfinder, which drove our group. It delivered the majority of our revels. It was our big beast and it was what essentially was our only product when we floated the business. Um, we then added Gated Talent and more recently Talentis. Those are the three products that make up the um, executive search suite now. Now, clearly, as you can see from, from the chart, our executive search revenues have dropped pretty consistently for the last few years. What you will see is, although they're still dropping, uh, they are, the rate of, uh, of fall is, is unquestionably slowing down. The market for executive search software is, again, very challenging. Um, we are selling pretty much every week multiple times a week often to small single user executive search firms. These are typically new startups, firms that may not last long, frankly, with very little budget, but we're selling to those firms because there are very few larger firms in the market. Our view is that our Talentis product, our, our key executive search product, is now primed for the big time. The trouble is the big time in terms of the economy hasn't arrived yet. So our expectation for our executive search platforms is they will return to growth, but they will not return to growth until the market improves. And um, yeah, we, actually, we actually expect that for this year, our executive search revenue stream will reduce somewhat again. But we do remain absolutely confident that we will grow this half of the business as soon as the market recovers. But one of the points we wanted to emphasize from our, our report was the phrase, we expect to make further progress. I've just talked about a, a very gloomy market in which we're in. Well, we've been in a gloomy market last year, and we knew we were going to be in a gloomy market this year. So when we say um, in our outlook statement, but we expect to make further progress, we mean we expect to make further progress despite all of the above. Um, we have assumed in our cost base and our planning for this year that revenue will fall in 2024 from 2023. That's not going to be a surprise for us. And as we said in our annual report, uh, we're, we're in line with where we expect it to be at the end of Q1. Um, we've actually budgeted for virtually no new business sales this year. 95% of our revenue that we expect to realize in 2024 is coming from customers that were contracted or are contracted already. That's an extremely safe position to be in, an extremely conservative position to be in. Um, we expect that by the end of the year, in fact, our recurring revenue uh, will be at a level which, given our cost base, will be some 124% of our cost base to rebit the level. So again, giving us huge confidence in our ability to, you know, to see the future and uh, be confident in our ability to, 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 to build in the future. But what really matters, I, I think, is that the business is much more lean now. But we've developed an engine that can allow us to grow when the market recovers without extent, uh, significant um, additional investment in people or resources. Um, we will show better results this year despite the market. Uh, but for the next um, uh, few years as the market recovers, 
we fully expect to deliver growth. And when we deliver growth, it will scale. The margins we've built into the business now are unlike anything we've had previously, previously, and a much, much higher percentage of the revenue that comes in at the top will drop down to the bottom. So we're really excited about the uh, the opportunity for the business. We think uh, this will be um, a, a, another year of progress despite everything we're having to deal with, um, but we think the long-term opportunity for the group when uh, the economy recovers is, 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 is a really positive one. Um, I think that's that's all in terms of our, our questions, but Tom, uh, or our presentation, thank you very much for your time. But Tom, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, um, feel free to throw them at us. Yeah, indeed, yeah. Thank you, Jason, thank you, Ian. Um, we have a number of questions actually, but uh, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right corner of your screen. Um, but maybe we can start with you, Ian. There's a, a question which relates to your key topic here, which is the EBITDA margin. Um, do you expect the EBITDA margin to stay at this level or do you expect it to regress back to its former average? Well, we certainly don't expect it to regress, as I think Jason alluded to right at the end there. The margins that are now built into, into the business should mean that we at least stay where we are. You know, we hope to progress as revenue increases as the economy comes back, we expect it, the margin to improve. However, we don't expect to regress and it will at least, should at least stay where it is at the moment. It's probably worth me just adding that um, a, a lot of our legacy products involved huge amounts of engineers' time to implement them. So if we take Farfinder, for example, when a client bought that, um, an invoice would be sent, uh, an engineer would set it up, a trainer would do the training. That whole process might take a month, and so the client wouldn't start paying for it for, for, for another month. And we needed people to do that work. Now, as firms are switching to Talentis rather than Farfinder, um, they're typically having an online demo, then taking a trial, then putting their credit card in and going live. There's virtually no human involvement in the vast majority of Talentis implementations. And so as that, um, as, as that becomes a bigger part of our revenue share, the impact on the margins will be very obvious. Great. Okay. Well, thank you both. Um, just on the product theme, um, Ben asks, with the launch of the mid-office cloud offering, what are your expectations for adoption? And I think it's probably two questions here because it says, what are the USP for clients? Thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Thank you, Ben. So essentially, the um, what the mid-office product does is you have a CRM platform, which is managing your candidates, managing your jobs, putting candidates into jobs. And somehow, when particularly for temps, I'm talking primarily about temps here, when you have a temporary employee, somehow they need to get paid and that gets done through the payroll. What mid-office does is it sits between the two. So it sits between infinity typically, but not always, and a um, payroll package in the middle and transfers the data backwards and forwards. It's a bit simplistic, but that's basically what it does. Now, this is a product we've had for some time, uh, but it wasn't cloud-based. So uh, our clients had to physically install it on a box in the corner of their office, um, which is, 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 is obviously not the ideal model. Uh, we launched mid-office cloud late last year, and um, I think it's fair to say early adoption amongst our existing clients has been uh, very positive and probably slightly more positive than we would have anticipated. But typically, um, as I say, it is in, in the new market, there are very few larger companies buying anything at the moment. And so we're not seeing dramatic um, sales of it in the new market as we're not for Infinity or Farfinder or Talentis or anything else. But certainly the adoption from the um, our existing clients who've moved from our traditional product to this, paid a premium to do so, has been very positive. The feedback's been very positive and uh, we think we've got a very good product there. Super, thank you. And I guess just looking a little bit at markets and growth and rebound, um, a quick one here. Um, when do you expect the recruitment market to recover? And I don't know, can you add a little bit of color to that on what drives the recovery in that market too? Uh, yeah, um, the answer to that question would be no. Um, uh, we, we have worked on the assumption that there is no noticeable improvement in the market until Q4. And because of the nature of our model, which is recurring revenue subscription based, that means there will be very little impact on this year's results. We're working on the assumption that um, uh, it will start to recover in Q4 and you know, we'll be in a better place next year and beyond. And that's where the revenue growth will come from. But, you know, uh, the, the recruitment market 
is buoyant when people are hiring. People are uh, people are hiring when the economy is going well. We all know, you know, the, the, the situation that a number of, of, of regions are in at the moment. Um, if the economy recovers in Q4, as, as as we hope, that will drive our revenue next year. If it doesn't, if it takes longer, we'll still be profitable next year. That would be our expectation because of the cost we've made. It will just take longer for the revenue to come. Uh, but as I say, we're not expecting any real impact from growth this year. We hope to make some sales in the back end of the year that will help next year. Great. Okay, super. And Matthew asks, and this is a slight, slight tangential, but you know, how do you see prospects for international growth? And this is, and is this an opportunity to scale up? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Matthew. So, again, if we talk about our, our products historically, Farfinder has been sold internationally, um, but the majority and ISV as well to an extent. Uh, the other products are primarily UK or to push UK and Australia. Talentis is a truly global product um, because of the nature of it, the late light touch aspect of it. We essentially have um, you know people using it on every continent of the planet, with the exception of Antarctica right now already. Um, uh, the biggest market for that platform is likely to be the United States. Uh, States. I think we have more users in the UK than the US at the moment, but I don't see that being a long-term uh, reality. It's a product that we can sell pretty much anywhere globally. So uh, as I say, it, it, it is a, a transformational product for us. Once it starts going, it will be something we're selling all over the world to companies, small, medium and large, and it will be delivering very, very high margins. Right, super, very positive. And a quick question from Glenn. And some of the directors have purchased very few shares since releasing the results. They are able to do so, but it's surprising that if you're so confident going forward that these directors have not purchased more shares, why not? Uh, thanks, Glenn, for the, the, the question. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, I'm speaking for myself. Um, obviously, I'm a very large shareholder in the business. Um, um, I, I can't speak for all of the uh, the other directors, but I think um, I can't remember the last time that one of our directors sold shares. I know Ian bought some shares. Was it last year? Ian? Or the year before? I forget. End of the year before, I think. End of the year before. Um, I, 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 it, it wouldn't be for me to go into uh, too much detail on my thoughts on that but from from my perspective i'm a big shareholder i'm not looking to get out and um um i i i, I think it's a uh, um i'm not really i'm not really sure how to answer your question Dan. I, can't, I can't speak to my colleagues but uh, um yeah it's, i'm a big shareholder i certainly won't be selling but given the lack of shares in the market i'm not sure anyone would be um thanking me if i was buying them all up either no. Okay, fair enough. Great. All right. Well, look, um, that's very helpful. And um, maybe, uh, Jason, could you give us the, the 30 second summary of, of, of the investment case right now, and then we'll go to wrap. Yeah, of course. Well, firstly, again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate your time and your uh, uh, potentially your support in the business. Thank you very much indeed. As I say, just just to, just to summarise, we have had a very tough few years. Uh, there is no question. Those of you that have been with us for that period, we appreciate your support. We thank you for it. I apologise that it's taken us so long to come out the other side, but we have now come out the other side. The business is in a much more stable position. It will uh, improve further this year, regardless of the market, but we are very, very optimistic optimistic but when the um, um, economy kicks on we will benefit so um, yes thank you again for uh, joining us and uh, thanks Tom for hosting yeah not at all great super um, could I ask investors not to close this session you will now automatically be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback um, if anyone has further questions or would like additional information on Dillerstone please do get in contact via Dillerstone at walbrookpr.com uh, many thanks for attending today's presentation thanks everybody bye-bye thank you